Thank you so much. Um, I sure appreciate Rudy's talk because it, it was to the point and simple. And uh, I came to teaching uh, rather than ever wanting to be a teacher. I never wanted to be a teacher. It was the last thing in the world I wanted to be. I wanted to be the next Jack Nicholas. That didn't work out that way for me. But I was a player. I played at Oklahoma State University. I was lucky enough to be an All-American, which meant now you got to go play the tour. And I tried that for seven years. And when I finally had exhausted a lot of teachers, uh, had exhausted a lot of time, I ran into my mentor, a man named John Jacobs from England. And John changed my life. But more importantly, I was attached to John because his philosophy, the outcome, of his philosophy and the diagnosis of really swing mechanics fit me as a player. Because what he was trying to accomplish was exactly what I was trying to accomplish. You see, so many of us, when we look at swing mechanics, tend to take a more traditional classic view, uh, which would be something like on the screen. We try and identify, if you will, mistakes. A funny story that, that Jack Burke used to have this beautiful duck decoy that a man had carved and given him, and, and Jack always had it proudly in his office. One day a fellow went in there and asked Jack, he said, that's amazing that somebody could carve a duck and it looked almost like it was going to quack any minute. And Jack said, you know, he said, I asked the fellow that carved that, uh, how he did it, how in the world did you ever learn how to carve a duck like that. And he said, well, he said, what you really do is you, is you, take, a, you take a piece of wood and you cut away everything that doesn't look like a duck. <laughs> well, that's the way kind of most of us look at golf swings. We're going to diagnose them. You see, we, we, we look at this. We all of a sudden look at all the things that don't look like they ought to be a golf swing. You see. And chances are, as my mentor once said, all valid golf information helps somebody. We're just not sure that somebody is you. How many times have all of us told somebody that would be viewed from a classical sense of golf instruction, this is correct, and the guy got worse. Got a lot worse, you see. I owned a lot of people postcards apologizing for the lessons I had given them until I met John. And I haven't owed anybody an apology since. How do we tune that down, boy, Scott? Am I shouting too loud? No, sir. Because I changed my diagnosis of how I went about swing mechanics. You see, I believe in the quote that my mentor, John Jacobs, used to say that the sole purpose of a golf swing, the only purpose of golf swing, is to produce a correct impact. The method employed is of no significance as long as it's repetitive. Now I happen to shorten that in, in my books and works, and I say the sole purpose of golf swing is to produce a correct repetitive impact, period, period. So as an instructor, I tell the instructors I train around the world, I say, please, no cosmetic surgery. Whatever you're doing to that student, whatever you're doing, has to positively affect either their ability to make a correct impact or positively affect their ability to do it repetitively. That's all that's it. That's the only thing that's important, you see. And so if that becomes our goal, Everybody that leaves a lesson should leave it hitting the ball better, should know why he's hitting it the ball better, and what it looks like when he hits the ball better, and what it looks like when he falls back into his old default thing. In fact, one of the taglines of my company is, hit the next ball better. And you think, well, wait a minute. Too many times we give lessons, and you have to tell them they're going to have to be patient. Because we're making a grip change, we're making a setup change, we're making a backswing change, we're doing a lot of stuff to this person, and they're not going to hit the ball better. What I want to present to you is a way that you can eventually get to all that stuff you want, 
You can, you can build as classically correct a golf swing as you like, or you can produce enough Bubba Watsons or Jim Furyk's, if you like, or Gay Brewers or Arnold Palmer's or Jack Nicholas's or, or Fred Couples. None of these people had a classic golf swing. I don't think anybody's ever gone up to Jim Fury or Bubba Watson and said, who's your teacher? Goes, Gosh, I sure want to swim like you. Well, I want to swim like Adam Scott. Well, I think Bubba's got a better major record than Adam Scott. Jim Jarrett's one of the greatest players that ever lived. So what are they doing? What kind of diagnosis would we need to get to get there? Well, I believe that all movements in golf, if you will, will affect impact in one of two ways. And those two ways that impact that, the, that we're talk, I'm talking about an impact, make the difference of whether we can hit the ball solid or not. Solid is the name of the game. Like my third book I call Solid Contact for a reason. Is you can't play golf if we're worried in the outcome of how high the ball's going, how far the ball's going, how straight the ball's going, until we worry about how solid the hits are. Because if the fellow's standing there 150 yards from the green, he can't make up his mind whether it's an eight iron or a terrible five one, something, something in between, we've got a problem. Distance control is everything. It's everything. Your handicap, and Scott probably didn't say this, but I've used Scott in my program forever, but your handicap, your amateurs that are coming to your handicap is directly proportionate to the amount of greens he has. It is. And so the amount of greens he hits is directly proportionate to the amount of solid shots he hits, which is going to determine how far the ball goes, and to some degree how straight it goes. But I want a solid shot that finishes somewhere near his target. You see, that's, that's close enough for me. That's what it, I'm close enough to talk over 100 touring pros. That's close enough when I talk to a touring pro. Somewhere near their target. That's what Scott was saying. Right there. So what are the ingredients that allow us to take both solid and impact? Well, we could talk about face, we could talk about path. Those are not what it is, because if face and path were that important, Bubba couldn't play golf, because he has a 30-yard slice of the drive. Uh, Bobby uh, Locke hit about a 30-yard hook with him. Jason Day hits big hooks. Billy Castle one time hit a big hooks, and then he went to big cuts. Jack Nichols hit a big cut. So it's not face to path. You can hit solid hooks, you can hit non-solid hooks. You can hit solid cuts, non-solid hooks. It's not high balls and low balls. There are two different things that make you, your ability to hit the ball solid. And that has to do with one, the angle of attack when you hit the golf ball. So the angle, no, not the angle of attack here, or here, or here. It's when the rubber meets the road. What was the angle of attack? Well, each club has a slightly different angle of attack, by the way. That's why we can always hit something in our bag. Might only be a five wood or a seven wood or a hybrid, or it might only be your five iron, six iron, or seven iron, or might others. Sam Snead was the first good player I ever knew that made the observation when I'm driving at my best. I am not ironing at my best. When I'm ironing at my best, I'm not driving at my best. Because the different requirements, this game's a hard game. But the angle of hit is one. The angle of hit must be married to or match the club you're hitting. Obviously, I do not want to hit down with a driver, you see. And so I obviously, when Sam Snape was hitting the most up with the driver, he was probably maximizing his driver, and he was hitting terrible mid and short irons because he was hitting down too much. By the way, I heard the question earlier today. Somebody asked the fellow who said, How, the speed man, about wedges. Yeah, too much speed is a killer with wedges. Too much angle is a killer with wedges. Anytime you get a golf club 45 degrees or more, 
if it's 44, it won't be to 45, but around 45 degrees. When you start hitting it with too much angle or too much speed, the ball starts running up the club face on you because the face is too angled, you can see. And so when the ball starts running up the club, up here, you lose about 15 yards, and down here you gain about 15 yards, and that all of a sudden gives you a 30-yard long and short delta. One of the smartest things Butch Herman ever did with a young man named Tiger Woods, he said, you're a terrible wedge player, we need to go to work on it. And he shortened and widened his golf swing. A wider golf swing produces lower shocks and holds the club on the bottom grooves. The narrower golf swing, or the V down there, will slide the ball up. So anyway, the second thing we have, besides angle when you hit the ball, is width to the bottom of the swing. Now I'm going to show you what I mean width to the bottom of the swing. I'm going to use this. This would be a very sweepy bottom. A little Lee Trevino. Gary Player. This would be a very narrow bottom. Hello, Jack Nicholas. Hello, Tom Watson. No, they're not that bad. But it's why Gary Player, Lee Trevino used to hold one iron in the air and say, if you're in a lightning storm, hit this one, because even God can't hit a one iron. Because to hit a one iron, I've got to be able to go down, under, and up. The more I can go down, under, and up, that way, you see, the higher I can hit a golf ball. The more I can go this way, the lower I can hit a golf ball. I'm a great wedge player right here, which would be no Gary player. I'm a great long iron player right here, Jack Nicklaus, you see. So the width to the bottom of the swing starts to tell us something about being able to hit all the balls solid, you see. Now, geometry-wise, if the ball were right here, you'd say that narrow golf swing hit too steeply down on the golf ball. If the ball were right here, you'd say that narrow swing swung too much up at it. It's one of the problems with the narrow bottom of golf swing, you see. It's hard to get, absolutely get it in the right place. But basically, if I have an angle of attack that is too much down, or if I have a golf swing that is too narrow, Geometry-wise, I love math and geometry as a boy and a kid and in high school and in college, they work out the same in a golf swing when you follow what I'm going to present to you. So I call any time somebody is hitting down too much on the golf ball, which is too steep, or their swing and or their swing is too narrow, that's a plus. Now, it's easy for me to remember plus because the down thing. It's going down, they're crashing. Anytime their angle is too much up or their golf swing gets too sweepy, I call that a minus because they're circling the field. Airplane won't land. You see. Now, everything we do in a golf swing, everything. Put your head over here, your head over here. Whatever you want to do. Everything you do in a golf swing will affect that impact by making it either more plus or more minus. Now the object of golf is to come to the correct impact for that golf club. A driver is obviously a fairly minus angle. A two iron, believe it or not, is your most plus angle over there because we've got to get down under and up this thing. A wedge goes back to a minus angle. So every club is a little different, but the correct angle for a correct golf club, I'm going to call neutral. 
we hit a home run. What was needed to happen for that golf club happened. Okay? So that's neutral. So that means that your golf swing produced an impact that was neutral. Again, a neutral golf swing, since every move we make in golf is going to affect impact as more plus or more minus, I'm going to go throw them here a bit. A neutral impact is an amalgam of a whole bunch of these pluses and a whole, an amalgam of a whole bunch of these minuses, you see. And we got them balanced. We're the scales of justice out there for one day. We're just fun like that. All bad shots, all of them, every single one of them, come out of one of two impacts. Either that impact was two minus, I mean two plus, or that impact was two minus. The scales of justice is got falling the other way. Let's see. Now what are some of the ball flights we can hit out of a plus impact or minus impact? I actually take all the ball flights, and instead of saying, well, you've got a push hook, a push, a straight hook, or whole hook, or whole flight, I just make them simple. There's 14 ball flight misses. We've got four misses right and left. We've got two right, two left. You can push a ball, you can slice a ball. Pushes always are minus, slices are plus because of the angles of hit. A push comes from an inside out swing path, which too often bottoms out behind the ball and swings up on a push. So pushes are minus, slices plus. Now, the other two all flight directional misses would be left misses, such as a pull on a hook. A hook is always over here. <coughs> Why? Level one of our instructor certification training starts off with ball flight misses, and I say, tell me what the face path relationship with the hook is. Everybody said, well, it's close face to the path. I said, you're right. And don't ever say that to anybody again. Because the way we formulate our English sentences, the face was close to the path. What's the villain in that sentence? The face. It's the subject, you see. I say to them, please say the path was to the right of the pub face. Now you've identified the villain. You see, I can have a three, four degree open pub face, a three, four degree closed pub face, I can have a square pub face, all of them I can hook off the face of the earth if I have a path to the right of them. And the more my path is to the right of them, the more I hook them off the face here. I don't know why we're trying to stabilize club faces out there when it's not the club face that curves the golf ball. It's the club face, the force. If I had somebody stand right up here and I hit them right through the middle of their body, they go backwards. But when I start hitting them over here, they spin. Or I hit them over here, they spin. Soccer players understand how to make a ball hook. They want to hook a ball up into the left-hand corner of the net, they kick to the right. That's what makes it know why we're calling it tugging and pulling and over the top. It's none of those. It's quite the opposite. A, a hook is a push force out to the right because its next door neighbor is a push, you see. A slice is taking force and 
there's a golf ball, and I'm going this way, and there's the center mass of my golf ball. Well, regardless of where I hit on that club face, which means how closed or open that face was, the force will always be going through that side relative to the center of the golf ball, the path will be hitting. And the more it goes through that side, the worse the hook, I mean the worse the slice. You see, the hook's the other. So I would call that pull and that push, personally, but I'm afraid that we're not understanding pushes and hooks. Understanding them relative to the club face. It's really relative to where on the ball that force is going to be. So, anyway, that's why I call pushes and hooks. Now, let's talk about balls that are hit on the toe and the heel. It's an off center hit. Not always, but most of the time, when somebody hits a ball off the toe, the club has not gone far enough away from them. Now, there's a lot of reasons it can't go far enough away from them, but virtually if you have a plane of a golf swing set up to hit a golf ball, there's the golfer, pardon my drawing there. There we go. He's picked it out here. What happened in the downswing is the club, for whatever reason, got too vertical not far enough away from me hitting the toe. There's several. Well, that could be several reasons, but because it didn't get horizontal enough out there to hit it, you see, I call toe balls pluses. And I call heel balls, or shanks, if you will, to minus. Something got too horizontal. Something sent the club too far away from me. So I'd say the heel there. Now let's talk about contact problems. Contact problems on the ground. Fat and thin, chop and chunk. Those would be the two opposite contact problems. Fat and thin always is a minus because something's back here. Something's swinging desperately in the well. Something is back footed. Something is a mile behind to cause the bottom of the swing to occur back there. So fat, I'm going to put F and T, fat and thin or minus, chop and chunk. The opposite's plus. We're catching that ball way too much on the down, you see, for whatever reason. I haven't talked about the reasons yet. Right there. So there's eight ball flights. Let's talk about tops. First time, I, whenever I see somebody top a ball, I go, huh, was that a steep top or was that a shallow top? Was he swinging up on it because the bottom was behind or was he swinging down so much he overreacted and didn't crash <coughs> into the ground and pulled up and topped it? You see, so we have tops in both camps and they're both very opposite. Let's talk about low shots. I actually have two low shots. You've got a low steep and a low shallow. The low shallow shot is played with long irons and fairway wood. That's when you've got somebody who can't get a three wood in the air. They can't really get their five wood in the air. They can't, you look in their golf bag and you say, what's the longest iron you got? You look in there, it was an eight iron. The rest of them are all head covers. You know, that's because they're so shallow that they cannot get the down, under, and up to happen. All they can do is sweep along the ground or swing up at the ball. So you've actually got a low ball flight that's shallow, and you've got one that is steep. Now, what would that be? That would be called a low trap. 
That's when somebody is trying to quit slicing. They're still swinging out to win. They're still steep, but they say, somebody is going, all you've got to do to get rid of your slice is close the club face. Remember I said the face doesn't cause the slice. The force causes the slice. But somebody told him the face was causing the slice. So now he goes out to win, closes the club face, and he just squishes the ball virtually too low in the ground. Don't hook with anything from a, about a seven iron through a drive. So you can do too low. Plus. Now too high. You do low. High shallows, if you will. High shallows are somebody who has got the swing too narrow, but they're catching the ball on the upswing. I would say Jack Nicholas's wedge shots were always high shallow. He didn't take a divot on them, believe it or not. He picked them and had caught the ball on the upswing. Oops, I put that in the box. That's our right. right there. And this is Jack right there. The high shallow over, I mean high shallow over there, the high speed is obviously somebody that's hitting crashing and chopping and chunking, and they, they're always hitting their wedge too high with a deep divot. They're always hitting their driver, if you will, chance of rowing, chopping it up in the air. Too speed. It's very interesting when you get the high shallow, you can always tell, high shallow and high steep, you can always tell it with a wedge. If you're confused about it, just ask though, if he takes a big divot, that's a high steep. If he doesn't and just clips the ball, these, the golf swing is too shallow. The reason why I talk about these ball flights <clears throat> is the first thing I think you have to identify who's in front of you. Every time you give a golf lesson, who's in front of you? Is it someone who's hitting the ball wonderful, or is it somebody who misses or coming out of an impact that is too plus or too minus? Kind of that simple. If they're coming out of an impact that's too minus, they're hitting one or several of these minus golf lines. If they're hooking, they're also pushing, and they're also hitting their irons back and field. If they're pulling, they're also slicing, they're also probably chop chunking. You see. So it's pretty easy. You're having breakfast with your next student. You say, tell me your favorite club. He says, we're right. You already know it's too shallow. Because he can hit the shallowest required impact out there. That's his favorite. You see. You, then the next one, you want to see how shallow he is. In other words, is he a sweeper or is he a shallow on a narrow bottom hitting straight up on it? So you say, do you use a three wood off the ground very often on a par five? And he'll say, I never even use them at all. In fact, I can't even five wood. Then you know it's too sweepy, you see. He's a sweepy, too shallow. But he says, yeah, no problem. I don't really have a three wood high. He said, I bet your wedges go straight up in the air, too. You can't control the distance. He said, you've been watching me? Said, you never saw I hit a ball, but you know, because he answered the first two questions, you know all the other questions. You see. Now, that kind of comes automatic to me, because I was trained by John Jacobs to become kind of my own track man teacher. So when I first start watching someone hit golf balls, I am not looking for any mistakes like that. I'm looking for what's his impact mistake. What is his ball flight impact mistake? That is number one. And I know that mistake is going to fall in one or two categories. You see. Either it's going to be a plus or it's going to be a minus. I just need to wait to see one of those bad hits come on. Graham Marsh, I used to teach Graham Marsh years ago. First time I ever taught him, we were down at the Players' Championship. And I was running late to work with him. I was over with one of the other guys, and so I said, I'll be there, I'll be there. And then I got over there, and he had his bag set up there, and he had all these irons out. 
sat there. And he was standing there, and the ground right here was absolutely virgin grass. <laughs> and I said, you've been waiting to hit something? He said, no, I've been hit. I said, there? He said, yeah. I said, well, those? <laughs> they were done. He said, yeah. I mean, he hadn't shifted a blade of grass. I said, are you hooking it terrible? He said, yeah, I'm really coming over the top hooking it terrible. Well, he wasn't coming over the top at all, but I knew he was hooking it terrible. Hadn't even seen him hit a ball yet because he had, he had been there an hour and hadn't moved any grass yet. So that's how valuable that is. So now the second thing I do, the first thing I do is look at what the impact is. The second thing I do is look at what he's doing to cause the impact. What is he doing? Like, he was a minus. Okay, Graham Marsh was a big minus. So I'm looking at his golf swing. Where's my biggest opportunity to neutralize his huge minus impact. Where is the opportunity at? You see, I don't, I'm not looking so much at, at how classic his golf swing is. Well, let's change your grip. Well, there's a, not a lot of opportunity changing the grip. There is some, not a lot. In fact, there's not usually a lot at a draft. There is some. But I'm looking for the biggest opportunity. Now, what are those opportunities I'm looking for? So let's start writing some of those down. Plus, minus. And I said anything in the golf swing and everything in the golf swing will affect impact towards more plus or more minus. All things are not equal, though. Kind of like a bowl of fruit. You got some maybe some little raisins down in there or something. You got some grapes. You got some pears. You got some apples. You can make maybe have some watermelon. I mean, some things are going to make impact hugely plus or minus. Some things, just a little bitty, aren't really going to change it. So I'm not looking for the little bitty ones. The first ones I'm looking for are, if you will, the great big ones. Well, if I look at this chart just a little bit differently, I can now see some of the big ones. By the way, I got this chart off a fellow who posted it on YouTube. And he said these were the nine deadly swing-shaped falls. None of them are deadly. Let me say that very clearly. None of them are deadly, and I'll explain that in a minute. They're simply movements. That's all they are. They are movements. So let's start stop thinking in terms of classical terms, but what are these movements doing? Well, you can see the mice on that flat shoulder plane is obviously producing an airplane that's going to maybe circle the field, and a sway is going to produce a spine that's tipped backwards and a golf swing that's got not lax width hanging back on the right leg. It's going to be a minus. Helps somebody swing the club up. Casting and scooping gives you width. A slide gives you width the other way. Early extension gives you width. Over the top makes it steeper. Reverse spine angle. Deeper. Chicken wing makes it a minus. Okay. Now, to kind of show you that these things aren't all that bad, all they are is movements. They're not hallowed things. There we go. Let's look at a few of these. Steve's Milk of Sing. A good player. Goodness. Jack Nicholas. Always early extension. Craig Perry, going over the top. Colin Montgomery, Swayze. A lot of people think Bone Arnold, one of the greatest hitters ever lived. Swayze, and there's old poor old Jack Nicholas again. 
He can finally do them. Reverse spine angle. Here we go, hanging back. Uh, for, forgotten his name. Uh, he won the Open, in fact. Uh, the US Open, several, uh, quite a few years ago. It was a great butter, by the way. Uh, David Toms, early casting, scooping. And finally, Lee Westwood. So we know these things are not the nine deadly sins. All they're doing is allowing these people to match up the rest of the minuses or pluses in their golf swings. They're just big bottom numbers. Any, let's go this through some of A dress position, a K position. That's a big minus, because I've got my spine tipped to the right. Can you see that? Handle forward. That's a plus. Uh, back swing. The flatter my back swing is a minus. The more upright my back swing is a plus. Now, why did I just now say the more? The more it is, the bigger the water number. The more I'm upright, I'm now Bubba. That's a big watermelon right up there. Jack was kind of a semi-watermelon. One of the things that Jason Day is working on, he's still upright, but he's lowered it. He's not as upright, trying to get rid of back pain because what's a minus in the downswing that so many upright golfers use? Back in my day in the 70s, a bowed arched back is a big minus. The single biggest minus you can make with your body in the downswing is a hip thrust, an early extension. We're trying to get everybody out of that. I have no idea why. I truly have no idea why. Because it's a swing movement that will shallow out a golf swing that's too steep and it's too narrow, you see. Jack Nicklaus, Payne Stewart, Goodness sakes, Peyton Stewart was almost falling over backwards. He had his head down, because somebody said, keep your head down, he kind of looked like a turtle. But he was almost falling over backwards. And Stewart, everybody would say, what a great golf swing. We did have a great golf swing, because he balanced out his pluses and minuses, you see. The more a club is across the line, that's a good one. <coughs> How many people would vote for that being a plus? Raise your hand. You make a plus. Not one, two. How many is not fair? <laughs> so the rest of you think it's a minus. You think it's a minus because the guy's going to swing down this way. We don't know. He died at the top of his <laughs> <laughs> So when he was at the top of his back swing, he was too steep. He wasn't. You see, the easy way to tell it, here's a plane. We're shooting this way. Anything in your dress position or your back swing or your down swing, that's three of the four swing segments, that lives above the plane is a plus. Anything that lives below the plane or makes impact below the plane to max, guess what? At impact, the fall through perfectly switches. At impact and the follow through, these are all pluses, minuses. The more as you swing through, the club starts appearing in front of the plane. That's a huge minus. That's into out. The more it's appearing below the plane, that's a big plus, you see. Out to in is a big plus. In to out is a big minus. The widest swing you can make is a minus laid off club at the top and in to out. That will produce the widest bottom in the world. I took Matt Kuchar one time up to Dallas to spend a day with Lee Trevino. 
Matt likes to pick all the old timers' hands, and so we went up there, and his, his lady loves to talk, so we had a perfect day. But one of the early things Lee says, thank you, Max Wayne, Matt, with wedge. Got to hit a full wedge. Thank you, Max Wayne. So Matt, I said, okay. And he took a back swing up there, and he says, okay, take your right hand off the club, and can you touch the club? And Matt, good. And he said, that right there, that's your problem. That's why you're not a better wedge player. Because he wanted the thing where you couldn't touch it. That's laid off. That's why. And now we swung it down relative to him from the inside. Widest bottom swing you can make. Can't make a wider bottom swing. You point left, which is a minus at the top, and into out in the down swing, which is a minus. Guess what? The narrowest golf swing in the world oops, is the one we were getting to across the line. Across the line and turn into it. Across the line, now swing you out to win. By the time the club starts moving, it's like a world of piano being shoved out of 30th floor of a building. I mean, it doesn't fly. It's crashes. <laughs> So if you have that the steepest person in the world, and he's across the line, you're probably going to tell him to get the club pointed more left and swing more into out the easiest way to start getting somebody, if you will, right there. Think of Bobby Jones. You ever watch Bobby Jones? There it goes there. All of a sudden goes there. And then he starts swinging. You see, Jack Nichols there, back there. Start swinging. Jason Day used to be there, back here, start swinging. This one's an interesting one. I don't consider that wrong. I do not consider casting wrong. It's just wrong for some people. It's right for some people. Obviously, it worked pretty good for David Combs. You know, it worked pretty good for Tom Kite and KJ Choi, too. And, 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 uh, Tom Watson, there are lots of width up there. Why would it work for him? Because if your golf swing is too narrow and or too steep, casting is just a minus. And I say to anybody who's casting a lot, and you want to help him, don't get rid of the cast, because now the poor guy's going to break his club. He's just going to smack it into the ground. Find the watermelon that is way too steep that's causing the cast, you see. Because he's just, same thing with somebody back footing it. If he's back footing it, I promise you, it's not because he's not with the other fellow standing right. I believe in what they're talking about, by the way, the standing. I believe completely. That's just fantastic stuff. But in terms of somebody back footing it, you tell Bubba to quit back footing it, and Bubba's done. Tell Jack Nicholas in his heyday, Jack. He used to fall back. Gary Player was playing right alongside him. He used to walk forward, didn't it? Amazing, trying to beat one another doing that. Jack was too narrow and had to fall back. That was one of his minus angles. Gary Player was too sweepy. Taking a step forward is a huge plus angle, you see. So what I would challenge all of you to do is take the stuff that you like to teach. Maybe you like to see a golf swing a certain way. Maybe you like to see upright swings. Maybe you like to see more rounded swings. I call them one plane and two plane, but they take difference. Whatever you like to do is fine with me. Y'all are getting results or you wouldn't be here. But start labeling the things that you like to teach that you feel are correct in teaching and label them. Are, are they simply a plus or a minus? What am, I, what am I telling people there? Because if you have somebody walk up to you, he's a pretty good player, he's got a minus impact, and he stands this way at the golf ball, And you tell him, we need to fix your address position is the reason you're hitting it bad. You know, his address position is a plus. 
He's got a minus impact, and you take that address position right over here, and you just throw another minus into an already minus impact. And that's how you make people worse, you see. It's not that you're telling them the wrong thing, because that's a right thing. You're telling the right thing to the wrong person, which is what my mentor used to say. All valid golf information is good for somebody. I start being make sure it's good for them. So kind of how do we work through this now that we kind of can understand if you will an impact. We can kind of understand I didn't go through all the anybody want me to go through more of them? More weight on your right leg is minus, more weight on your left leg is a plus. More you turn is a minus, less you turn is a plus. Why did Ben Hogan not want to turn his hips? Because his swing was too sweepy. And turning his hips made it sweepier. Why did Jack Nichols say, I don't know about Hogan, but I'm trying to turn my hips all I, can, all I possibly can? Because his swing was too narrow, and he was turning his hips to get the swing wider. So if we, if we, you know, I love the opposites, if you will, arguments we have in golf. <coughs> Bend over, no stand up straight. Swing your arms back, extend your arms back as far as you can, no, load it early. Swing the club around you, no, keep it in front of you. you see. Use your hands, don't use your hands. Turn your body, slide your body. This goes on forever. Force plate issues go on forever. You ever notice nobody has the same trace, and yet we're trying to mimic somebody else's trace? <clears throat> I don't use force plates for that reason. Not that I don't think they're good science. They are good science. They're not good application. There's a difference. We've got to learn to take the information that tools give us and decide is that information from that tool apply which one of my students does that apply to? Because there isn't such a thing as one size fits all. You know, we're going to get everybody in the same force plane. A couple of few years ago, Cooch was with Chris and I at the BJ merchandise show and they were going through new force plates. I was just interested. It's crazy seeing I'm interested in all this. And so Cooch comes up, he says, I want to get on that thing. I said, no, I want to get on that thing. The man gets on it, and this guy says, I've never seen a, a trace like that. No, because Matt's got a funny old golf swing. You see, my first student, I've taught a ton of girls on the LPGA tour, and then my first perfect men's student that got real good was Peter Jacobs. I turned his career totally around. And I was lucky because Peter had a pretty golf swing. And so everybody, Peter's swinging good, and everybody says, I want to take one to Jim Hardy because I like my Peter Jacobs swings. Well, my partner is a guy named Chris O'Connell, who lives in Dallas. And Chris's first student that got famous was Matt Kutcher. <laughs> and nobody's saying, tell me I want to take one to Jim Hardy because he's a teacher Matt Kutcher, do you see? But in fact, he changed Matt's life. Matt had enrolled in a real estate course to become a commercial real estate broker with a fellow in Atlanta who had graduated from George Day. Matt had won the U.S. Amateur and almost won the Masters as an amateur. Almost won the Open as an amateur. Turn pro bingo, third tournament he wins. Two and a half years later, he's off the tour and he's on the whatever it's called then, I can't remember what the... Nationwide? Probably the Nationwide. Or something. Two years after the Nationwide, he's lost his card there, and he's playing as a past champion on the regular tour. And he can't play at all. So he calls and wants to see me. I can, I'm in Colorado, so I said, okay, Chris, you're the man, you're going to go see Matt. So Chris gets to the airport, Saying, I know I got a phone call. He says, I'm joking. 
What do you think I ought to do? I said, man, I said, Chris, you know exactly what to do. Find out the shot that's killed him and take it away. What's kind of cool, Matt wrote the forward for my third book and talked about that first lesson with Chris O'Connell. He had been hooking the ball so bad he couldn't get off the ground. And had been going to everybody and was still hooking the ball so bad he couldn't get off the ground. And he talks about in there how it took three balls to get the ball into the air. Three. And quit hooking. And the rest is kind of history. He won two of the next three tournaments and won a few weeks and then won a third time. He was back on the regular tour and he started with it. You see, a hook, again, is a force to the right. The more you open a golf club, the more it's swinging to the right. Everybody who hooks badly goes, hmm, it makes sense to me to get the club face more open in the downswing and swing more to the right. Well, it doesn't at all. A chop slicer has the club face about seven or eight degrees close to the target. His ball is starting way over here and slicing. The more you allow, I'm not talking about open and close this way, I'm talking about tip the club relative to the target. Can you see what I mean? If I tip the club close to the target, it starts coming out. And the more it goes out, the more it goes left. The last thing in the world a hooker wants to hear is would you close this club more and swing it more to the left? Which is exactly what Chris told Matt. And Matt said in his forward, he said, it, it took me two balls because I wouldn't believe it. But I had nothing to lose. You see. I'm kind of one of my credentials I'm, I'm proud of is when they used to have the award PGA Tour Comeback Player of the Year Award. As players went four times or they lost their career and won it back. Simply because of some of these, exactly these things. These things that you wouldn't know I changed their golf swing. I changed impact. And I made it more correct and more repetitive, you see. So that's what we're looking for. So we're going back to, sorry, I didn't tell the story. Going back to my student in front of me, who is two, let's say he's two minus. He's coming, he's got a minus impact. So I'm going to look at his golf swing and see what's my biggest opportunity to get rid of that minus impact. And all of a sudden I get shocked. I go, oh no, I got one of these today. Because you have two students that come to you with a minus impact and two students that come to you with a plus impact. Thank goodness one of these two and one of these two are giveaways. They're the easiest lesson of the day. You're just clicking along, they leave, they're happy, you've just done great. There's somebody whose golf swing is two minus, and they're hitting them two minus. There's somebody whose golf swing is two plus, I'm gonna show you some swings here in a minute, and they're hitting them two plus. And you're clicking on all cylinders, and so far you've killed them all day long, and it's four o'clock in the afternoon, and you're going, only one more left today, and along comes this one. Because his golf swing looks just the opposite of impact. And he overreacts at impact. What do I mean by overreact? He's the guy in an airplane who's falling asleep at the wheel and all of a sudden the airplane is coming towards the ground just like that. And all the, all the voices in the computers inside that airplane say, pull up, pull up, pull up now. Pull up, pull up, pull up. And he pulls up. And he hits a shallow one, you see. He's now hitting straight up on the ball. Or it's the person that's around here. It's the famous figure eight when we all see. Comes around here and then goes there. 
because he's around here, he won't hit a golf ball. He'll hit a baseball, but he won't hit a golf ball because golf ball is located on the floor. You see? So he's got, oh boy. And that's when your hands, your hands are full. Because you've got to neutralize the originating mistake, if you will. Not the overreaction. Because if you neutralize the overreaction, let's say the guy comes and he's a minus, minus, and he's one of these. We call them two fixers, two, two, two overreactions. They've got both too steep and too shallow in there. And he was two minus, so you said, I'm going to give him something plus to help him out so he can hit the ground. Well, by the time you get there, he is so plus, now he doesn't overreact, he's a pilot to the ground. He's the one where the voice in the computer never woke up the pilot. Boom. Now that often happens, unfortunately, with track man. If you take your data and log off a track man, also watch and see if the fella equals what the data on track man is, or is the track man data an overreaction to what he really is. Does anybody not understand what I'm, what I'm going with? Because they're kind of tricky to get to. Let me show you some examples here. We're going to have some voting, by the way, on these. There we go. Now, the first thing we're going to do with this doll is we're, we're, we're going to take a look. Oh, I've got to keep planning. Ricky. Can I get him again? No. Let me get, let me sit in here. Okay. Get out of everybody's way. Okay, we'll show you him also from another angle. He's actually got the ball, if you look real careful, let me get him back to address if I can, and we got the other one. He's actually got the ball on a tee. You can't, you can't see it. And you can see we got a Graham Marsh here. He hadn't hit a blade of grass out there yet. But if we take him to the top of his backswing, plus angles, I'd say, right there. His left arm is broken down. He has no width. He's barely turned his hips at all, you can see. He's got a pretty good tilt in his shoulders and his spine. He's left most of his weight still on his left leg. He's got one minus element right there. I bet you all can't tell me what it is. Somebody tell me what the minus element is. The cast. What's that? Cast. Cast. Cast? Yeah. We well, hadn't done it yet. Oh. He might die right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at, at his friend here. Over here, the other fellow, when he gets to the top. Face is open. What's that? The face is open. Was that you, Tommy? Yes, sir. Uh, he went through the course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. An open or opening club face is always a huge minus. There. 
for several reasons. Open or opening. Guess what? Closed or closing is a huge plus. I was showing you a minute ago. There, I'm going to open that club face. Can you see that? There, I'm going to open the club face. Right here. Anytime, here I'm going to hold the club face closed or close it in the back swing. You see. And you close it, it wants to stay in front of the handle. When you open it, it wants to immediately go behind the handle and live behind the handle. Slicers are trying to close it. Hookers are trying to open it, and that's the very reason the force goes where it goes. A chop slicer opens the club face to shallow the angle. That's why. The angle and the force that's out to end is causing his slice. His club face is making it worse. In fact, if he back foots it, and opens the club face enough, he can actually hit a complete shallow hit. And I always tell level two, where they're actually teaching live students, beware of the shallow slicer. Because the shallow slicer is one of these guys. Right here. The shallow slicer is the guy that should be showing a plus impact. Right there in his shoulder line. So, what are we going to do with this fellow? Let's get him back to the top of the backswing. There we go. Okay, any suggestions what we ought to do? Sure, somebody's got a suggestion. Keep his face closed and get his weight right. Get his face closed will make the back swing steeper. Is that not steep enough for anybody? It's too steep. We've we got to get some shallow angles in here in the back swing. Or at a dress. Let's get him back here to dress. Anybody see anything they'd like to do there in the dress? If you'll notice, everybody that bends over a little too much always has straightened legs. Anybody that doesn't bend over enough always has bent knees. So I would bend his knees so he could stand up and make a flatter shoulder turn. Or I'd leave him where he's at and I would flatten his arm swing, his club. Let's see where he was here. I could bring his handle back, you see. I could put him into a K position with that spine tip back. More right there. Yes? I could put the ball position more forward. Good for you. Exactly right. So, you see, any of those things. When I said to Chris, find out the shot he hit and get rid of it, I also added, and I don't care how you get rid of it. Meaning, Chris used to be frozen. You remember the bracelets people wear? What would Jesus do? He used to wear one that says, what would Jim do? <laughs> because he was, he, he was always second guessing himself. I said, Chris, you know, you might not pick the minus for this guy's backswing that I would pick. Okay? He might not. You might not. But if you're picking a minus, you're a winner. You see. Because all of us have to make perfect backswings to play great golf. We don't need to look like Adam Scott. He just needs more minuses in that backswing. It's a little bit like while we're being aggressive, huh? I go out to make a cup full and I make a gallon of it. Because I'm tasting and it needs more vinegar. I'm going to move to my finger. I'm going to talk forever until I hear right. But if you have to throw three or four, a couple other drafts, maybe a couple of these backs, a different thing or something, do it 
until you've neutralized him. Now, some things are easier for him to do than others. So you need to pick the ones that are easier. And before you begin your excursion, tell him, I may ask you to do two or three different things depending on which one is easiest for you to do. He goes, because he's scared death you're going to ask him something he can't do. And so you're on his side now. And you explain to him in the simplest of terms, we're landing an airplane. Your airplane, sir, is coming in on this angle. On the top of your backswing, you are set to do that. And you overreact every time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get your airplane coming in on a better glide pattern. Don't stop there. And what you're going to do is still overreact and probably miss the ball completely. Now, if you haven't told him that part, and he gets to the better glide path and whiffs one, and you say, great, you did just what I wanted you to do. And you whiffed. He's going to say, whoo, look at the time, i got to run. You walk. But if you say to him, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to get you an easy club to hit. You've got a five wood here or seven wood or something. He goes, yeah, I'm going to get a longer club. Do you know why? Because a longer club is farther from him. A longer club sits more on that angle. I've got a chance to tell him to match up the angle of the shaft. I've got a chance to say to him, sir, all golf swings are circles. You're familiar with two circles. You're familiar with a Ferris wheel and a merry-go-round. Would you take your right arm, trail arm, would you take your right arm and swing it like a Ferris wheel? Yes, sir, that's exactly what you do. <laughs> Would you take your right arm and swing it like a merry-go-round? That's what you don't do. So it's something like that. And then say, now what we're going to do, we're going to tee this thing up about this high because you're going to come in on a glide path and you don't know how to land your airplane yet. Don't worry. The part about landing your airplane has to do with simply an overreaction. I'm going to take away the reason you're overreacting, and in about four or five swings, you'll quit overreacting. Then what do you do? If they don't, give them a boss on the downswing. In this case, I'd probably give him a Gary Plyer. You see. Something that's going to let him steepen up his downswing, get it down to the ground right there. Any questions on this guy? What we might do? Okay. <coughs> now, how many people vote for steep, narrow down uh, impact? Obviously not. <laughs> It's super shallow, super sweepy. You see. But if you look at the golf swing, you realize you've got an easy day ahead of you. Because any plus you tell him is going to help him as long as it's in the swing, swing segment that goes minus. Okay? So we're going to break him up and look at his swing segment. I judge everybody's backswing to be good enough that they should play golf from there. And it's a dress position to me. Oh, I've seen tour pros a lot worse than that. <coughs> Feet are square, knees are square, hips are square, shoulders are square. Looks like he's got a pretty neutral grip. Posture good. Anybody see anything to really pick on? Lines it up low on the toe, but I'm okay with that. 
They might know why he lined it up on the toe after seeing his golf swing. His downswing goes too far away from me, you see. So he just avoided the shank by lining it up out there on the toe. So let's see how he looks at the top of his back swing. There we go. Somewhere in there. There. Now, how many people would vote that the top of back swing looks too narrow and too steep? Anybody? How many people would vote that it looks a little too shallow to me? Come on. Anybody else? Couple, got several. I would say, if anything, it's a little too shallow. But I don't think that's where the watermelon is. I think the watermelon's about to happen right now. It just happened. That club has gone so far behind him. He is trying everything he can to hold that club face from closing and swing it into out because he thinks his hook is over the top. That club face is only how far from the ball? It's, only, it's a foot from the ball and it's 90 degrees open almost to the target. Can you see that? There he goes. Now, we've once again got opportunities that I talked to Chris about. I don't make a lot of difference, really, what you tell him that's a plus. If we were all emergency room physicians, and a guy in a car wreck came in, really busted up in the car, we've got 50 doctors sitting around just punching the bed to help this guy save his life in the car. So we all examine him. And first one of you says, he's got a broke, crushed pelvis. He may have had some severe back issues. Okay? He's got a broken left leg. And right now he's in shock. And we've just got to get him stabilized. We've got to get him out of the shock and cut down any movement that might save that back we can and get him in a cast as soon as we get him out of shock. Come tell us says, he's in shock right now. He might have internal injuries, but he's certainly got a crushed pelvis. He's got a broken left leg. I think he's got a, a hurt back. And I think we need to operate him. We need to operate him because he might also have some internal injuries. So it goes that way to five or six doctors. And so all of a sudden, the seven, every one of them is going to treat him a little different. Somebody's going to put him in the air cast. Somebody's just going to immobilize him. Somebody's going to operate right now. And then we get to the doctor who says, uh, gee whiz, I think he has a concussion. And he said, well, the brain scans all look pretty good here. Well, he already has been through a lot of trauma. I think he's got a concussion. Well, what about the pelvis? Ah, wouldn't worry about the pelvis. Wouldn't worry about the knee. Wouldn't worry about his back. We got a problem with things, you see. I don't mind the first seven or eight or ten doctors who all were making the same diagnosis. They have a different treatment, but they're all treating the same problem. I have a problem with the other fellows. He's made a completely wrong diagnosis. And that's kind of what I'm saying here. I don't care what you do to plus him in the downswing. You can make him try and feel like he's swinging more out here. You can make him try and pull the club across the inside ball and play a slice. You can make him start his downswing by closing the club outward instead of opening inward. You can make his downswing start with his hips and his shoulders so the club starts going down instead of going out instead of coming down behind you. Any of those things are treating the correct diagnosis. Any of those things, this guy walks away better. Walks away. That's the challenge. The challenge is every student walks away better. So whatever 
of those things you want to do, you're in the right place. You make this style a little bigger. Got a lot of light coming in, don't we? Can everybody see that okay? Tricky one in my books. How many people vote for a steep, narrow impact? Plus, plus impact. One, two, three. Oh man, we're voting. We're counting them today too. It's in there, This is Texas. So the rest of y'all voting for a minus impact, is that right? Beware of the shallow slicer. See these divots over here? Those are pretty good divots. If you look how steep they are, and they're all pointed left. Now he does have some big minus elements to his golf swing. He's got some minus watermelons. He's got more plus watermelons. Now let's take him to the top of his back swings. This is kind of a junior golfer that you know what I'm going to do with you. Because he loves to play golf. Now, anybody see a problem with his back swing? Hold around if you do. Huh? Would that be a plus or a minus? A big plus. I would have to say personally that about 80% of the guys that play the tour don't look that good to come. So I would be very accepting. I would not try and find my error there, but it wouldn't hurt, you see, Simply because in his downswing, he's throwing in huge watermelons. And one of them is he falls outward. And so what you're seeing there at the top, by having some weight on the toes, it would appear, would maybe lead him to fall outward. So I certainly would, would not go away with that. But right here is where we all of a sudden start making the mistakes. Did you see that? Now to me, his body is in pretty good shape. The club face is enormously open. That is the minus watermelon I see. It's only minus watermelon. But he has thrown his arms so far out away from him. There you can see the steep impact. And he's thrown the club so far out away from him that all he can do is pull it back in across and stand up. Now it does extend too late. There's a number of minuses you could give him, and I'd be giving them to him in his downswing personally. If you told him to hip thrust right now as he starts down, instead he does the opposite of a hip thrust. Can you see that? He actually increases his spine angle by lowering his left shoulder. Right there. Whereas if instead he raised his right hip outward towards the ball, push it outward and in front of the ball, like Jack Nichols, like Justin Thomas, like Payne Stewart, if from that same place that happened, give him a Justin Thomas. Can you see where the golf club automatically goes? He goes back here. Now when Justin gets bad, his drops a little bit too much behind his plane, and he gets to pushing the ball that way. Okay. But anytime I say, I'm going to 
kick the football that way. I can't go that way. You said. Right there. Actually, I worked forever with Scott McCarran. And one of the things we worked on the most, because he would be, he was a, he could become a shallow slicer right from the top. Because he was coming this way and then would kick so hard there. So I used to have him take his shirt, pull it out. First move from the top, lower his shoulder. Because I needed to give him steep angles. Right here's the opposite of Scott McCarran. If we could start his downswing or Justin Thomas with his foot and his hip to rock him back this way, which would rock him back more towards his heels, like what you're saying, he would immediately drop the club down from the inside. Now, if I didn't want to do that, there he goes. I have got to do something to get his arm swing. If I'm not going to use the body, to get rid of that arm swing. Let me get him out there. He gets his arm swing stuck way out there. God, I have a drill that I teach people called the bowling drill, which I take an imaginary bowling ball, where I say all the pins are out there where that golf ball is. Would you just bowl them down there underhand? He said, now, a lot of people are afraid of that, especially a slicer, because the underhand feels like it's going to open the club, you see. And they're already going, wait a minute, you're telling me to open the club and swing it to the right. Maybe you haven't seen where my ball's going. Well, it's the same thing. It's just the opposite thing I'm telling Matt Kutcher. Wait a minute, maybe you haven't seen where my ball's going, I'm telling you to close it and then we're left, you see. Open it and go more right will cause him to hook. It'll cause him to hook badly because the more you open, if this is the center mass of a golf club, the more I open it relative to the ball, the more the center mass straight right and he's going what says hook about that what says left nothing does except the oblique spin you're putting on the golf ball you're virtually hitting the side of the ball just like that you see so the more i can get him to drop the club down behind him instead of in front of him he's already got it pretty open if i can get him to drop it down behind him you see the worst thing you could do to him would look at that open club base slicing and say, we need to square that club base up. Because now you're giving somebody who is already a real plus, 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 plus impact, another plus, a big plus at that point in time. I keep all these things on my phone, a jillion pictures, because pictures are worth a, a thousand words to students to see kind of what people are doing in different positions, if you will, or different areas of the golf swing. I keep videos as well as I 
just start my ball flight cocks with these two pitches. And I say, one of these players hit the ball, dead on his target, fading. The other player missed his target 40 yards left of that left bumper. Now, can y'all see the club face right here? Mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Okay, still open. How many people vote for that ball missing the target left? One, come on, two. Look how close that face is and it's swinging to the left. You're not voting for that one going 40 yards left? That was a high cut. Mm -hmm. Because of the force. <clears throat> that, Jonathan Bird, I took that picture at, at uh, used to be called Redstone, and Shell Hughes Nolan. That ball missed the bunker over here left. It's again, it's not the club face. That club face is dead shot. That club face is wide open. That club face had a terrible hook. That club face had a, had a slight fade right onto the target. So it's how, it's how we can get fooled. So, in kind of closing, I'm going to say 80% of your lessons, 80% of your lessons are going to be what I call the one. The person whose golf swing appears too steep or it appears too shallow, and that's what they're going to have. So on that person, if you're a, what I call a model teacher, I've been accused of that, I'm not. All I did is wrote my first book and said there's only two ways your arms will swing relative to your body pivot. They'll either swing in an opposite direction your body pivot or they won't, they'll swing in the same direction. Meaning they'll either swing around you as you pivot your body or they'll swing up and down as you pivot your body. And the two make the geometry of golf dead opposite. One golf swing is always looking for more width. The other golf swing is always looking for some steep, narrower angles. You see, that's the huge, and, and that's where we get all the differences in the arguments between those two. But basically, what I'm talking to you all about is whatever your. This is not a bad word, by the way. In, in, in the context of music, whatever your prejudice is. We all have a prejudice when we see golf swings. I love that golf swing, I didn't like that one. You know, the PGA Tour comes down, you're gonna go out and follow those golf swings you love to see, you know. You're not gonna probably follow the ones you're, you, 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 know, you kind of go, I know Jim Jerry's good, but I don't really know that, I don't know. That's what, that's where we're at, you know. And so if you're teaching a particular look, that's fine. Just teach the right minuses to a plus impact that you see, and teach the right pluses to a minus. If you all of a sudden see the impact violently change, let's say violently, you've got a minus impact, and all of a sudden the next thing you know, the guy is plowing dirt you missed the number two guy. You missed the first guy we had up there. You gave him a plus to make his golf swing more plus. You, you follow me and then all of a sudden he plus right there. That's all right, you can recover from that because now you got some one fix. You've already neutralized his plus angle. His plus angle by giving him a minus, now you just got to neutralize, I mean the other way around, his minus angle by giving him a plus. Now you just got neutralized the other one. Right there. But this is so important to you. Several years ago, I was invited to be the keynote speaker at the annual convention of the UK PGA. Scotland, Wales, Ireland, England, and the whole, the whole world. 
And they had done, they had commissioned a focus group, professional focus group uh, analysis team to go out and find out why more people weren't taking lessons. And they came back from their focus group and they found that only 3% of all the total golfers were taking lessons. Of the hardcore golfers, that was 12%. Now, 12% of the hardcore golfers were taking lessons. But of all golfers, only three total across the board. And they wanted to know why. Reason number one came back. Reason number two, reason number three, reason number four. All of them were the same. Fear of getting worse. I said, now isn't that something that all these, our target market, our target market is afraid, he's afraid of it. They're afraid we're going to make it worse. Wouldn't that be something if we felt that way about all doctors? You would never go into the doctor's office. You're telling you to go into the lawyer's office. <laughs> The doctor's got a sign in his office and says, come on in here, I'll take a look at you and I hope you don't die. <laughs> That's what they're thinking about us. They're scared to death to take a lesson because it's, now the reasons were, the reason was they were going to get worse. But the reasons they thought they were going to get worse was they were going to be asked to do too many things. They were going to be asked to do things that were too difficult for them to do. They were going to ask me to do things that were going to require too much practice. They didn't have the time to devote to the practice. You see. But in essence, they were afraid. And that's why I've kind of started teaching all over the world this message. Is if we can leave every lesson with the golfer hitting the ball better. We might be known as an unconventional <coughs> teacher. We might be known as a guy just giving a quick fix, if you want. But we're not. We're not. When, I, when John Jacobs first taught me this way to <coughs> analyze golf swings, when I said earlier, it's because I believe it. As a player, I wanted one thing to happen. I wanted to hit a predictable shot dead solid. I wanted to know what it was going to do before I hit it. I didn't care what it looked like. I'd, I'd play golf with my shoes on backwards if I thought I was going to do it better. I wanted to play better. Now, on occasion, you will get a personality type. They're known as green personalities. It's four personality types. The green personality, which is highly detailed, they're usually college professors, and they will want to do it correctly in their mind. And so when they see a video of their golf swing, they're not interested in hitting the next ball better. They are interested in doing it correctly. Well, guess what? You can still help him because the steps towards correctness still have an impact and they still have a movement that's either a plus or a minus. You don't need to tell him, oh my gosh, you're hitting better. Hey, that's wonderful. I didn't realize that. Hey, you're doing good. You're a heck of an athlete. Great go. Meanwhile, you're teaching him exactly the same way, but you're giving him the detail towards building a more Adam Scott model of golf swing, if you will. You're just doing it. You're selecting the pieces he needs rather than just cutting everything out of there that doesn't look like a duck, you see. You're cutting everything out of there that doesn't look like a steep impact or a shallow impact. 